room is uh, Andy Hawkins, and Andy will tell us something about Chef and will give us a, a little introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, all. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here and delighted to be in Nuremberg. So, as I said, I'm going to give you an introduction to Chef. Um, we'll take some questions at the end. And uh, I'm going to start off by asking people in the room sort of where they come from, if people would just put their hands up. How many people in here are, are devs? Operations? Cool. How many think of themselves as DevOps? Small number. That means you share the pain when you've got to get an application live, yeah? Okay. So I think of myself as DevOps, and I think of myself as being in that position for a while. So let me just start off with a really brief introduction of myself, and then we're going to start looking at some of the use cases for Chef. We're going to think about what Chef is, uh, and how it can apply to the modern IT landscape. And then I always think it's nice to think about how you can use Chef in a product, a project rather, <coughs> rather within your environment. So we'll, we'll finish with that, um, and that should take us around 45 to 50 minutes. So my background uh, is as a solution architect. I started off with some of the early cloud platforms uh, where we really thought about DevOps, but before DevOps was a movement, and actually before cloud was, well, cloud was, it was too early for some of those companies. Companies like LoudCloud back in the dot-com boom where automation was everything. Um, and as you can imagine, in that environment, we used to go off and roll our own automation. So I heard the previous speaker talking about shell scripts. I was one of the people that spent hours and hours and hours writing bash scripts in order to automate my own environment because scale had become too great for me. I then spent a period of time with the data center automation tools, which appeared around uh, sort of 2002. Uh, and I must say, I, th I think that the open source community is blessed with having some great tools like Puppet and Chef and various other tools that are out there, because data center automation would take you weeks before you even got the server installed to get the platform on. Now, with these modern generation of open source tools, you can pull them down, and you can be building things within hours. It's a true revelation that is empowering the, uh, the whole DevOps movement. Before that, I was actually a systems integrator, building solutions for large clients, and I built big solutions for people like BT and a number of banks. And that's where my whole heart got into this configuration management area. How many of you are using some form of configuration management within your environments today? Quite a lot. Quite a lot of Puppet. How many people are using Puppet? How many are doing it themselves, rolling their own? Yeah? OK. Anybody using Chef? <coughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so it's always, like, always nice to have a few supporters in the room. So let me just uh, roll through a little bit. So for many of you, you probably have already heard of Chef, automation platform built for developers and systems engineers in order to define, build, and manage infrastructure. Our founders were the people that helped us set up EC2, our CTO, and people who ran Amazon. So they've really learned the hard way about building systems at scale and managing configuration for the longer term. Um, our goal is to try and give you a platform that allows you to create what we call infrastructure as code. So you could actually then start to manage your infrastructure in exactly the same way as you manage your development and your application. It gives you a really uh, robust approach to build and rebuild and maintain state of an environment. Everything should be done programmatically, in our opinion, uh, because that is a great way for promoting reuse. And actually, when you've got a proper configuration management framework in place, you can start transitioning tasks to a number of people within your team. Uh, and the classic scenario for uh, using infrastructure as code is when something fails. I've got all of the artifacts that will allow me to rebuild my environment from scratch really, really quickly. We offer a hosted service. We use Chef to rebuild our hosted service in the event that there's a failure. And we can do that in a matter of minutes. It's really, really important for us. So question, when should you start considering configuration management? A number of you put your hands up, a number of you didn't. And my answer is it's always earlier than you think. It's sort of when you've got N minus one servers. Uh, as I said, I built my own platform, first of all. We probably got to about 30 or 40 servers, and we were doing it manually. 
And it got to the point where we just couldn't deliver the services manually. I was essentially in a DevOps role. If only we'd started 10 servers earlier, putting configuration management in place, I think we'd have been in a lot better position. And then often you see configuration drift. We use a, an analogy, every snowflake is unique. How many of you in your environment have got servers where every server is unique? Quite a lot, I imagine. So before you suffer that drift, and forgive me, being mischievous, after you outgrow Heroku, there are lots of platforms out there that give you great starting points to automate your environment, but think about scale, think about the next step, think about the life cycle. So sort of when you need to set up the third machine. Personally, I like to think about configuration management early because once you've started to automate early, you can go off and do some things that are of more value to the business. Much like the last speaker said, the speed of change is great. If you can start doing things to empower the business and operations doesn't become a constraint, it's fantastic. So how do you get to configuration management? Well, frankly, we all start off, we just build stuff. And we document it in text files. We create a wiki, perhaps. And then those of us who are thinking about infrastructure as code or have a recognition that configurations need version control, we'll start checking those things into some form of configuration management script, uh, system. Then we think about building systems from templates or golden images. Uh, I used to work with a, a VMware partner and Everything to them was, or to, to my role there, was building things from golden images. Thinking about the longer term life cycle was always a challenge. So configuration management is there to help us think through and address those challenges. And ultimately, many organizations with scale, speed of delivery, number of projects or products they're delivering, they ultimately resort to some form of automation framework. From what I've said so far, does that resonate with any of you? The people that have started to do configuration management, did you do it for any of those reasons? Some muted nodding of heads, okay. So let's just look briefly at what Chef allows you to do, the sort of use cases. So Chef is really a platform that's gonna allow you to do configuration management. Well, you already knew that, I said that. Configuration management to me is about creating a desired state for your infrastructure, that infrastructure as code model, in order that you can actually then promote that across your life, your life cycle. Desired state equals the actual state of the environment that you're running. And as you update the desired state, because you learn more, that should be inherited by your infrastructure. We also think about, and we're increasingly driven to think about, continuous application deliver, uh, delivery. Continuous deployment, continuous delivery, continuous integration. Configuration management is a key component of that tool chain. But that tool chain is quite complicated. A tool like Chef will play an important part, but not every part in that. A scale out web, web applications, web operations. As you want to grow your estate, you want to be able to push out more and more web servers, more and more load balancing environments that are identically configured, or at least are configured so that they will allow the traffic that you want to push through them to be pushed through correctly, and with zero deltas. And we're seeing people nowadays using things like Amazon where the cost of acquiring your infrastructure is really quite cheap. So you can stand up high performance computing environments very, very quickly and very, very cost effectively. And these environments are built in hours. They're run for as long as the, uh, the analytics cycle takes and then they're pulled down. Typical use cases that we're seeing them for. But let's sort of think about your environment as it stands at the moment. How many of you start off with a single server when you're building an application in development? Yeah, we all do. We build an environment on our workstation. And it works great. And again, the previous speaker said, we trust the developers to do things smartly and not to deploy or build applications that break our infrastructure. But breaking it happens. We all know that. How many of you have been up at four o'clock in the morning fixing a problem? Because I've been fired four times in one night for doing just that. So we start off with a single server and we think our problem is really easy to solve. Configuration management isn't required. But then we start to see our environment grow. Most of our applications these days run on multiple tiers. And as we find out that the database becomes a, a bottleneck, we add a second database. Then we go off and we add another application server. And then it becomes apparent that a load balancer is required within our environment. We need to start thinking about how we can tie all of that together through configuration management in order to make our landscape manageable. 
How many of you are using cloud-based providers for your infrastructure? EC2, Azure, Google Compute? Compute? Okay. So as we grow our environment in these sort of, uh, of landscapes, we actually find that also we have a whole lot of unknowns. When I provision a server, do I know the IP address? Perhaps I don't. Do I know what host name I'm going to be given as part of the provisioning cycle where I can set it up? So we've got to start thinking about how to manage some of those unknowns within our configuration. And how do we do it all? It's the tried and tested approach of using configuration scripts. Um, again, another question. How many of you actually tie your configuration into some form of software configuration management system? Git, SVN. Fantastic. So you're already realizing that there is a, an absolute need to have version control on all of your configuration data. Because as you go through your life cycle, you're going to learn things. You're going to change configurations. Really, really powerful. So when I started building my own, I immediately used a very legacy configuration management system called RCS, where I held all my configurations. The only way that any configuration, whether it was an application or infrastructure, got to a box was if it came out of that repository, because then I had the confidence that what I was deploying was my desired state. If anybody went onto a box and changed something, it's because I'd failed as part of my deployment pipeline. So as I said, as we grow our infrastructure, we add things like floating IP addresses because that's what the cloud demands. And rapidly, we've got our own snowflake. So the server is one level of the snowflake, but our application architecture is completely different level of snowflake. And frankly, if we get a configuration delta on any one of those tiers, we can change the performance profile, we can reduce the security and give ourselves an additional attack surface that people will go after. So it's critically important that we know what is out there. Uh, and you'll hear me in a moment talk about the data that is part of your configuration being really, really important for you make design decisions around how to do your configuration. Because with configuration management, with automation, comes huge, huge power. So, I've talked about an environment where there's involving complexity, but many of you, I guess, are running IT organizations where no longer is the consumer internal, it's web-facing. So now you often go off and you put up secondary and tertiary data, uh, um, data centers in order to give you high availability, and your problem has just got a whole heap worse. Um, as I said, I got fired four times one night for doing the right thing, but getting configuration wrong while delivering a new service that was critical to go out to, to, to the environment. It's not fun. I certainly didn't enjoy it. So that's the problem space. And it's a problem space a few of you are nodding at. And of course, we think configuration management is the answer to completing that problem space. Um, one of the most common ways of doing this is to use some form of virtualization. And are many of you virtualization users? Yeah, VMware, Zen, Vagrant, the whole plethora of different technologies out there. And often when people start to think about using virtualization, the first thing they try to do is create golden images in order to deploy their infrastructure. And it's a great starting point. But for us, we find that you create a golden image how many do you have in your catalog? Anybody got an offer, going to offer an answer? How many images do you have within your golden image catalog? Only two. Brilliant. Great job. Anybody got tens? OK. I find quite a lot of people have got tens of golden images. And making, managing, and updating those golden images is a real pain. So if we look at an environment such as this, when we want to do something really quite trivial, we want to change the SSH port because of a compliance policy upgrade, put it onto a different port. Sounds pretty simple. But actually, if you've got golden images, that can be six golden image changes. And of course, you may have different versions of your environment in pre-prod, in prod. So you could actually end up making a significant number of changes. And in order to make those stick, we delete, we relaunch, and uh, often we do that manually. I heard the word orchestration a moment ago, which has uh, a lot of connotations. Um, often it's a man with a clock, with a run list, 
think about what they've got to do. And uh, when I've done that in the past, I told you I got fired. Because we make, humans make mistakes. We choreograph things in the wrong way. We, uh, we make a typo. It's just human nature. Uh, the result is an invalid config, but it could actually be that your business is down. Uh, and in this day and age, that just doesn't cut it. You can't afford to actually work in that environment. So uh, let's get on to the meat of the conversation because configuration management can be resolved and addressed. And I work for Opscode. We think Chef is one great way of doing that. Okay. So our goal as part of the, uh, the configuration management that we provide with an ops code is to allow you to programmatically provision and configure devices. That doesn't just mean when you build a device. That means throughout its whole life, which may be two or three years, or actually maybe short-lived if you move from one cloud provider to another, which is a quite common use case. But using things automatically in order that you don't actually have to keep touching the, the keyboard and changing configuration. I said earlier, we believe in the philosophy that all of your configuration should be in a source repository because configuration data is like any other code. Our goal is give you the ability to recreate your business, your application, your service very, very quickly. Do it from code. Actually give yourself a backup clause so that you could use it for DR potentially, which is precisely what we do in our environment and make the best use of your bare metal resources at the end of the day. So we're going to start talking about some of the concepts that are key to Chef in a moment. Uh, as you will imagine, a node is one of the most primitive building blocks of your environment. And Chef is an environment which gives you the ability to generate configurations on your node. Some configurations may be static. We'll have a look at a few examples in a moment. Some may be data-driven. So your node should be able to actually inquire what its configuration data is, pull it down, make some decisions, and then actually run that code on a machine. Part of our philosophy is that you as the designers, the systems engineers who run this environment, know the order in which you want to do things. So you should be able to create a run list which procedurally goes through each of the steps that you would normally go through in order to configure your environment. We like to think about the ability to abstract and simplify things. How many of you think about managing a node as a single entity these days? Probably fairly few. We think about the next level up. We think about a web server, a database server, or some other function within our environment, because that gives us the ability to create patterns that can be reused across our whole estate. And those patterns represent good practice or best practice within your environment. And then rather than managing at the individual device level, we can start to manage at a higher level in order to make wholesale changes and perhaps think through or use that orchestration type uh, of example that was given earlier. And I've said it several times. Storing the configuration of your programs in version control. We're actually not prescriptive. We'll work with many of the version control systems that are out there. Many of you who are here are probably using SVN or Git. Pretty cool with us. So we're happy to use any of that. So let's look at a few more of the sort of the concepts of what we're trying to do. Um, those of you who are familiar with Chef will often hear uh, experienced users talk about resources, and then they may hear them talk about providers. So resources are really functions that are presented to you through that abstraction layer, through the DSL, which makes up Chef. And you'll find when you actually download and install Chef on your machine for the first time, you're presented with a large number of resources, routes, users, groups, tasks, packages, things that you can actually do within your environment. Again, we'll look at some cookbooks in a moment, and they'll make those contextual. But fundamentally, what they're trying to allow us to do is map onto networking requirements, provide and build files for you from data, perhaps create file systems, and various other things. So all of the things that you think about within your normal day-to-day -day work may be supported by these resources. A colleague of mine uses an analogy for resources and providers. Uh, I go to a library, a very, very large library, and ask for a book. Um, 
how does the librarian know where to get that book in a, a very, very large library? They'll go off and they'll find the book in their book recording system. They'll then go off and they'll find it on the shelf and they'll bring that book back to me. So in order to do that action, the resource is go get the book. The provider is the ability to go off and find it within that vast repository of books. Having used that resource once, I don't need to relearn it. I know how to go off and get that. So that sort of level of abstraction is built into Chef. But of course, in your snowflake, in your own requirements, there may be some things that aren't there. So Chef gives you a great way of actually building your own resource providers, as we call them. So that mapping yourself, resource and a provider, written within our DSL. Um, and that really gives you the ability to think of Chef really as a, a fantastic software development kit. Software development kit for your infrastructure. You can extend it, you can make integrations. It's pretty easy to do, and a lot of the vocabulary for doing that will be very familiar with you when we actually look at some of the uh, interfaces. So, um, much like many of these current range of configuration management products, what we try to do is be declarative. We don't tell you to go off and code how to do something on a system. We give you a resource that allows the system to understand, based on its platform, what to do. Um, and think of the Chef server as a great big publishing engine. Typical web app. It will allow you, from your managed node, to go off and pull its configuration down in order to deliver the configuration that you require. That makes it massively scalable. Uh, we have environments with thousands and thousands of nodes running on one relatively trivial Chef server. In fact, the platform as a service Chef offering is run on about five or six Chef servers and supports tens of thousands of machines. Massively, massively powerful. Um, config, com uh, compare this with some of the previous generation of data center automation tools, where actually you'd have to go off and pull down the package, you'd have to write some imperative language around what you want to do, it would take you weeks and weeks to get going. Chef, as an engine, uh, through this declarative interface, makes it really, really easy for you to do that. So I asked about your, your makeup earlier, uh, a few devs and lots of operations people in the room. And bring it straight to the table. Chef is written predominantly in Ruby. As you can probably see, I'm not the youngest guy in the room, and uh, I started off as a Unix sysadmin. And when you think about Ruby, you think, ooh, that might be hard. Well, Ruby is a pretty easy scripting language, and I'm sure that even that all of you ops in the room here can work out what Ruby is doing in this instance. Uh, it allows you to express patterns in a, a relatively straightforward scripting way that you could actually then use to deploy your environment. But Ruby is a great vehicle for us because it allows us to make Chef do pretty much anything. The libraries that we have that are out there will allow you to make API calls. You can go off and you can create and instantiate files. You can write templates. Ruby is pretty powerful, and that's the reason we use it. Every server that you're going to use will have a Ruby uh, platform deployed as part of its Chef environment. We'll just think a little bit more about the architecture as well while we're doing that. The Chef server itself, predominantly written in Ruby, but actually we're using Erlang in order to provide the API layer, and that's really based upon scalability. And then within Chef, we have a canonical data store that becomes an index which you can search for all of your configuration data. And we'll have a look at that in just a few more moments. But um, time to learn, Chef. You're going to see in just a few moments is really, really quick. Ruby is powerful, but Ruby, uh, the DSL we put on top of Ruby, makes Chef really open and easy for you to use. So I just want to introduce a few terms um, and give you a little bit of color on them. And then we'll look at some cookbooks, which are the building blocks of, of Chef. So Chef is an agent-based system. On your machine, you're going to run the Chef client. It is an agent, and you can run that manually. You can run it through some form of daemon, or you could run it as cron. So it becomes very, very powerful for automating the delivery of your environments. A lot of people integrate that agent into their runbook tools so that they could actually create a central orchestration for very complicated jobs using tools like Rundeck. So it gives you the ability to choreograph some very complex movements. 
Um, we think of uh, abstraction throughout. So when I think about managing a node, I would like to think, can I actually manage a whole environment with the same concept? So you probably put out a whole load of different servers in your environment, but there are some building blocks that are going to be common for all of them. Do you monitor your servers? Yeah. Do you have some security packages? Do you have backup? These sorts of tools can become part of a role. So if you think about building a new environment, you're going to probably attach a personality to it. Create a role called base, for example, that includes those key tools that you need on every single server. And now whenever you change, because you've learned more about the package type or the, the version, when you change that role, that software can be inherited by all of those machines at its next agent run. It becomes a really, really um, efficient way of making change <coughs> across your environment. <coughs> Further to that, you've probably got a range of different stages within your shop. The developer we trust to go off and create good code and test it in a logically similar environment to production. And therefore you can deploy to the development environment, perhaps deploy their workstation in order that they get the right set of tools and the right configuration. Um, but developers are already always running ahead of where operations are in my experience. They're looking at the next great thing for the business. So in production, you may be tailing by one or two versions of a particular piece of software. So environments are a great way for you to keep those compartments you're familiar with and pin versions of software so that you've got absolute conformance across your state. And then when you want to promote, you can change the run list or the role in order to inherit the software that you need. So a great way of giving you reliability as you move forward. And for those of us who, who are already believing and working in the DevOps world, it really is a good way of engaging with the developers early on. Here's the agreement of software that you're going to get. You go off and write your software, your code in this environment, and I can guarantee you that it will run in production. If you need to change that agreement because you've learned something new, you need a new library, let's engage early. Let's really create that sort of DevOps philosophy where we collaborate in order that that new version can be pulled into your standard pattern and deployed to your workstation and at the right time promoted to the QA environment and onto production. So enforcing a great way of working together, and I personally have found this initially to be quite painful, but ultimately to be very, very rewarding. I learn new skills, new skills. the developer learns new skills, and when you're de delivering applications into production, it's great to have that team of people that are all intent on making the application work rather than just delivering their functional bit of code. DevOps means that the application is only accepted into production once it's delivered automatically through these processes. And that pulls development, test, and production people together really, really efficiently. <coughs> so cookbooks. Cookbooks are a package for chef, and they contain run lists, which could be recipes or roles that allow us, sorry, that allow us to deliver functions to machines. We'll look at some cookbooks in a moment. And then everything that you do with Chef is indexed in this canonical data store, which is hugely powerful for dynamic configurations. We'll look at some examples of each of these things in a moment. And then if you're familiar with Chef, you're going to be familiar with Knife. Knife is our command line tool around which you do all of your configuration within the Chef environment. Um, it's beautiful that so many of you from an operations perspective here, because I would imagine whether you're a Windows or a Linux or a Unix guy, you're all going to be familiar with some form of command line tool, whether it's PowerShell or some form of, sh uh, of shell-based engine. You're going to work in a very familiar environment, and you're going to create cookbooks using your very familiar editors. So the skill ramp is really, really quick in order to become familiar with Chef. So I talked about cookbooks a moment ago. So cookbooks and recipes are really collections of resources. Uh, a cookbook can contain multiple recipes. So I'll give you an example of what a, a recipe might be. We want to install Nagios. Uh, it was an example that was given for monitoring earlier. We're probably going to have two recipes, one for the server and one for the client, because they have to do slightly different things. But as a package of work, they perform a function around Nagios. So we can have 
recipes. We can make our um, cookbooks really simple and just deliver straight text. We'll look at examples. I could actually then start to um, enhance the straight text to actually start using some of the data within my repository to make things really very, very flexible. Um, and I don't want to drop files or create users or use any of those resource types that I described earlier. Um, and most chefs will have knife open at any one time, they'll be editing a cookbook, and they'll be looking at the wiki to make sure they've got and they're using the appropriate resources. Um, so having created this cookbook, I can make things really, really reusable because of that data-driven approach. And the beauty of this open source community is that so many people have contributed willingly to the product and cookbooks. So there are hundreds of cookbooks out on our website already that you can download, and they're probably the best way for you to get used to and familiar with building environments with Chef, literally in a matter of half an hour after you start using it. Of course, the caution is the cookbooks are contributed by the community, so if you want to use them, check them out. Be careful, download them, review them, make sure you're comfortable that they'll fit into your environment. But you'd be surprised at how many of them are a really great starting block for actually deploying uh, configurations using Chef. So what does a cookbook look like? Uh, this actually is a default recipe for a cookbook. Um, we'll use Knife in order to create the structure and all of the templates that the cookbook will use. But then we populate it with our own code. And this is one that's been pulled directly down off the community website. Um, I don't think it's going to take too much for any of you to actually understand what this is doing. Um, and this cookbook ultimately will contain simply two files. Really very, very simple. So the first thing that we're doing, we've got a resource type of package, and we've got a name of Apache, which is, in the case of something like Ubuntu, what the package is referred to when you use an apt get. We're saying, actually, what we want to do is go off and install that package. I said earlier, ordering is important. So if you want to go do something with software in your environment, the very first thing you're going to do is grab and install the package. So this will, when it runs, it'll go off and it will download the package from a repository. Could be off the internet, could be a local repository because you've got your own blessed packages for applications, for example. And once it's downloaded it, it will install that package. Really quite straightforward. Obviously, having installed it, we want to start the service. And we want to enable it so that when the machine reboots, Apache is up and running for us. So again, really easy, very straightforward uh, part of a DSL. And no website is complete without its own index.html. So here, we're simply saying, create for me the index.html file. Do it from a file which is stored in configuration management in our files directory called index.html. And that's it. If I attach this to a server, or I attach this as part of a role to my web servers, this will be inherited every time Chef Client runs. So incredibly efficient, very quick to write, immediate use. Let's look at something a little bit more complicated. So is that cut off on the left-hand side? <laughs> OK. So we'll have to fill in, guess, guess a few of the, the letters on the left-hand side. So here, exactly the same thing for uh, something like HAProxy. Installing the package, but here you'll notice that we're actually making this data-driven. For me, with configuration management, you've got huge power, but huge responsibility. The fact that you've got a store that you can look at makes, this, makes Chef really, really powerful. I can use this as part of my templates. So here I've got the ability to create a template file from a .erb file. So um, this is a Ruby templating language, similar to PHP. So the syntax, again, is pretty easy to pull up. And I've got really fine-grained control as I actually instantiate this file. Who owns it? What permissions? What services it's going to use? How it's going to use those services? And an ability to notify externally. So the beauty of me declaring all of this within this cookbook is that if, heaven forbid, I log onto a machine and change something manually, I can detect the change. I can reinstate desired, the, the desired model. 
So somebody changes the permissions or changes the contents of one of the files that is held within Chef, we can look back at our configuration management repository and we can do one of two things. We can run in dry run mode and we can just declare that there is a difference. And how often do you wish when you're troubleshooting a problem that you could look at an environment and say, what's changed? Often the most common root cause of a problem? Yeah? Okay. So I can check what's changed using dry run mode and I can choose as part of my next chef client run to actually re-implement the desired state. Permissions, contents, ownership, all in one phase. So my vehicle to get me back into production really, really quickly. So having looked at um, some of the sort of resource types, this just gives you a, a, an articulation of some of the various things that are available to us. Re-establishing, uh, re installing packaging, packages, configuring, and then notifying a service, because a server often use exter uses external components. <laughs> I've brought up the topic of, of data on a number of occasions. One of the, the coolest features within Chef is search. A joke, but search for when static data isn't good enough. I used an example earlier. Will you know the IP address when you put a machine up in a cloud platform? Um, will something have changed in your environment? Perhaps you've got a whole load of different machines sitting behind and in front of load balancers. Will there be more or less than there were last time? So search is a great way of us actually inquiring from that canonical store. Um, it's actually held in something like either Postgres or MySQL uh, in order to actually understand what my environment looks like. And I can build that into my recipes. So again, you're seeing essentially the contents of a, a cookbook. You're seeing that template that we looked through a little mo a moment ago. But we're actually using this, this reference through search, looking at an index within Chef for any machine that's got the role of web server, in order that we can create a configuration that's dynamic on the fly to actually populate a config file that is haproxy.cfg. And then having done the population of that file, what we can actually do is we can use the, the template itself, the ERB, to go off and fill the values dynamically. So now I can actually start to scale my environment really effectively. I can start to do discovery of all of the machines that are out there that may need a particular upgrade or may not be in compliance. And I can start to think about complex orchestrations when I want to use a release strategy because I know that the data will reflect the actual state of my environment rather than something that has potentially been hard-coded. So that becomes really valuable when we start to think about something like scale out. So typical environment, I want to go off and add a new machine to that environment. Regular task, something I've done throughout my whole career. Um, and as I told you, something that I've often got myself into trouble for when configurations haven't been amended correctly. So in order to actually do that, what would I do? I'd have to create a whole load of different configurations. But I can actually do all of this with Chef. I could actually create a client and a server type of Resort uh, of, of recipe in order that when I made these changes, everything through my environment flexed naturally. Of course, I may need to do things in certain order, but we'll have a look at how we can actually help you to do that with Chef in a few moments. So, quite simply, Chef gives you the ability to build a whole, whole load of stuff and maybe some things that you hadn't actually thought were possible or necessary. Internal applications. So I've talked about packages for operating systems in the examples I've given you, but you deliver your application perhaps as a tarball or perhaps as some form of a compiled object, Chef can give you the ability to instantiate that. Workstations, I gave the example earlier of the developer who's gonna build their application and do their unit testing locally. Building their workstation is a real value add within your organization. There are lots of environments out there where perhaps you're evaluating them. You don't have a huge amount of knowledge of them at this point in time, Hadoop other sorts of NoSQL type databases. Because there are some great primitives within that community store, you can go off and start building those really, really quickly. Um, and you can do that to any scale that you want. And let's face it, some of these big data stores become very, very large very, very quickly. Uh, of course, infrastructure, platform, and software applications 
can be delivered through this as well. And we're beginning to see people starting to add networking, and we're beginning to see people starting to control their, control their storage with Chef as well. So there are some great implementations that will run Chef even on things like a, a Raspberry Pi. So platform support is pretty awesome. Our goal, automatically configure and give you the ability to reconfigure everything. We're pretty much a parity across Windows and the, the Linux Unix variants, which is really, really fantastic. It means the same approach can be applied consistently. And because we're using that DSL, you'll find that Windows admins and Unix people can all collaborate because they understand the language that is Chef. Uh, it gives you a great control plane for your environment. Um, and of course, cloud is adding a challenge for all of us, but it's giving us all great opportunity. We'll have a look at some of the options that we can use Chef for to manage and give you mobility around the cloud in just a few moments. Oops. So, if only we had a bigger projector. Let's look at the landscape that makes up Chef. I've mentioned a large number of things already, but just walk you through them. So we have a whole load of different nodes out there, which can be physical, they could be virtual, even things like Vagrant, but it might be a cloud machine that's out there and there are a wide range of cloud platforms. All of these machines will run the Chef client ultimately, but they'll also run a cute little plugin called Ohi. Ohi is a discovery engine. It finds out all of the information about your system and that can be fed back into our index, which can be then used for search. Um, got some really useful examples if people want to come and talk to me in a minute about how people are actually using OHI data outside of Chef. Cookbooks, attributes, recipes. We've talked about everything by attributes, but I think each of you will understand what an attribute is. It's a value that you want passed into some form of configuration. And then we've got uh, our Chef environment, and at the bottom we've got our, our workstation which runs Knife. So you're going to install Chef on each of these machines. Off the web, it takes about 30 seconds. You can be up and running. And using the platform service, you don't even need to worry about installing your own Chef server. You can have access immediately. Uh, and you can have access to um, a, a number of nodes for free. So, Knife, I've talked about it a little bit. We'll look at some syntax for Knife in a moment. But Knife runs on your workstation. So you log on to whatever your user is. You type Knife, it'll give you a whole load of syntax. And Knife will allow you to do a whole load of things. We can do Knife node. We can do edit, so we can change the run list on a machine. Of course, you might start off with a blank run list, which basically says, run Chef Client, grab me all the data that I can use later to make a decision, but don't actually install any software or configure anything. We can look at the machines that are managed. Uh, so pretty powerful. And then you're going to use Knife Cookbook to create a cookbook. And that will create the data structure and all the templates that you need in order to start populating those. The cookbook is written using your favorite editor, using the syntax you, sh you saw a little bit earlier. And then from Knife, you can create roles and you can create environments in order that you've got full programmatic ability to connect to anything within your estate. Knife talks to the Chef server, and it's everything within Chef is done using a RESTful API. So it's all authenticated properly. It's all digitally signed. With Knife, we can do some great things. We can find out using search what operating systems are running. You can read the other things on here. How does that happen? Oh, hi. Every time it runs, we'll report back into the Chef server and store all its data in that store. We can exploit that from, from Chef. And oh, hi, if you're interested, if we run it on a machine that's got a Chef install, whether it's your workstation or the server, it will provide you back a, a significant range of data. Um, here's sort of an aside. One of our customers is looking at cloud portability and the cost of the cloud. Within Ohi, they get a whole lot of data back around what platform they're running on, which cloud, which region, what type of instance. I don't know whether any of you guys know, but with Amazon, you'll find that because of their techn technology refresh cycle, in some regions you get quite high power machines because they're new for a relatively small size. Well, with Chef, if you can gather that data, pull it back through Ohi, you can start to do some cost modeling around where to place your infrastructure. You could actually do that around other clouds too. So it becomes a very, very powerful engine for them, and they've written some add-ons themselves in Sinatra in order to help them to, to make that happen. So we go off, we do a knife search, we interrogate the Chef server using this canonical store, and the data that has been fed back on the last Chef client run is made available to us. 
Sorts of things that you may want to do in your environment. Searching for a platform. Searching for machines that have got a particular version of a language. Searching for machines that have got a certain amount of memory, because if they're not being used at the moment, you might want to make use of them for a particular function, like a database server, where you might want to use a, co a cookbook that will actually carve your memory up so that you use it appropriately, giving yourself the right, the right level of SGA or, or whatever. So having gathered that data, what we then have the ability to do is using Knife to, to treat it as a relatively simple orchestration engine. Perhaps I've got version 1.5 of my cookbook for my web server out there, and I want to push it to all of my, oh sorry, of my Rails web server out there, and I want to push it to all of my Rails web servers in one fantastic stroke. Knife SSH, I can look up all of the machines within that store, I can then in parallel create a, a secure tunnel to each of those machines, and I can instruct the chef client to run now. If you've got 20 machines that you want to upgrade quickly, fantastic. If you want to do this in more of a staged process, of course you can start to, to select out the machines that you want to run that update on. And of course, this can fit beautifully within some of your production SLAs, because you can start choreographing things yourself or calling it through a, an external environment. So when we look at things like getting agents onto machines, historically it's been a huge problem for organizations You've got the technology to actually give you the ability to put an agent onto machine, to authenticate, to register the chef server. Um, this takes seconds. So I can use Knife bootstrap, bootstrap to a server, giving it a role at the time that I actually connect to it, so it will inherit the right types of software and configuration. Do that one touch. And of course I could use search in order to make that scan as well. So from here, I've got real power to actually get my estate under control. And when I talk to customers about starting to deploy Chef, I suggest to them, go in phases. Obviously, you're going to have a fragile object in your environment or something that you know so well that you can immediately automate. Think of those two sort of polars. But also think about the value of gathering that data through discovery in order that you can start to understand your estate and you can start to create a plan. So take the machines on board with an empty run list populate that OHI data, and start to make your decisions from there. I've talked about the cloud a little bit. So like being ambiguous about source control systems, we'll actually allow you to talk to a whole load of different cloud infrastructures. So really simple plugins that are available to us, we can allow you to talk to an EC2 cloud. We can talk to a Rackspace cloud. And from there, we've actually got the ability to stand infrastructure up from nothing in seconds. I can build myself 20 new machines on any one of these clouds with the right software immediately. Um, all of their data will be pulled back into Chef and now they are part of my ecosystem. OpenStack, exactly the same. And actually, when you look across the range of environment that we've got, we're, uh, we're pretty much able to cover not only most clouds, but most private clouds physical and virtual infrastructure. So huge portability across your environment if you should need it. And you'll find that many of these organizations are actually using Chef in some form at the back end to instantiate some of their infrastructure. <laughs> okay. So we're an open source company. Community is massively valuable to us. And um, we ask people to contribute. We freely accept ideas. In fact, I think much of the content around the Chef server has been influenced by what we've heard, and often by what we've heard in Europe. So um, keep those ideas coming. Everything that we do, we, uh, we suggest goes on the uh, Apache license, so it makes it contributable. We've got a huge number of contributors out there, and 800 plus cookbooks on that community site. So that in itself is a great enabler for getting you on board, and getting you productive very, very quickly. Uh, we're doing POCs that take days because clients use that community contribution. <coughs> so one of the challenges I often come across with people um, wrapping up now is how do I start using this stuff? And as you'll all know, learning a new technology can be daunting. What we're doing is we're investing a huge amount of time in actually helping people to learn the environment. So you could register for uh, an account, you can get access to our docs wiki, really easily. 
And then we're putting some seminars up on learnchef.com that will talk you through all of the basic setups, uh, all of the authentication of your workstations or your servers, the first principles of cookbooks, how to download them, how to install them, and how to get productive. We run training, and um, we're also pretty open to, to internal communication using all manner of different IRC-type channels as well. But the meat comes with when you actually start to, to work on a project. Um, I started using Chef first about 12 months ago, and my first challenge before I worked at, at Opscode was identifying the right project. Do I go for something that is fragile, that I want to learn the configuration data about, so that if it changes, I've got a record? Do I want to go after a new project that I know is going to be delivered in quick time, and where I can still engage with the developers to start building this collaborative DevOps type approach? I can't tell you what the answer is, but I can give you guidance on what I've found that's been successful in the past. You'll have already done a huge amount of work within your estate. A lot of that can actually be burned into and used within your chef cookbooks. But you've got to be prepared also to think outside of the box. The first challenge we have with people picking chef up is, I've got this recipe, what should I do? Should I model the data first? Should I write the recipe first? It depends on how your brain thinks, quite honestly. But for me, the easiest way to start getting going, use something like that Apache cookbook, start delivering some very static content, and then think about the use case that I have that will actually make my implementations quicker. Do I need to start creating virtual hosts? Great, well I can start looking at how to actually use Chef to do something like that. And for me, the key thing is, can I do this better, faster, higher quality? So start thinking about how you do things today, what skills are involved, and then start to measure that so that you can actually see the benefit as it goes across your organization. Because learning any new tool, as I said, takes time. You will make errors. So you need to have some sponsorship so that you can actually see the value of deploying such a tool across your organization. And that, to me, really means finding a good sponsor, perhaps the project owner, who's got to deliver something on a really tight time scale. It could be a case of identifying and assembling the right team. Um, I often look for the guy in an organization that's been saying, we can do this better, but doesn't just leave it there. They come up with, and I would do. Because if you can get that sort of mindset into your teams, you can actually start to build some really great content moving forward. And I like to try and find people who've got a compatible skill set, somebody from the development side, somebody from the operations side, in order that we can bring this stuff together as we're actually pushing out our new approach. Make changes, don't be scared to, but measure the outcomes. Um, and I love the approach where an application, when it's delivered, has to work first time. So collaboration is great, but your real proof of the pudding is when you sit there and you run your chef run on your infrastructure, the application from top to bottom is stood up. You can walk away having completed your embedded tests and say, we're good to go. That's, for me, the, the real golden proof of what we're doing. And then learn and improve. So, I'm at the end of my, my, my a lot of time, end of my presentation. Are there any questions? Wow. Should we start in the front row? Um, Just a second. Okay. <coughs> Thanks. Um, does Chef have any capability to do history, snapshots, rollback, something like that? Um, assume I, I, I make five changes, roll them out, yep. and suddenly I notice, um, oh, that went bad. Yep. Can I roll back? Would you roll back or would you roll forward? Is a, is a good question. Yep. So we have a source repository of all of the configurations linked to Chef. So ensure that you've got your um, code committed, versioned within the, uh, the SCM, maybe also versioned within Chef, and now I've got a record of what happened on my environment. I know everything that was deployed by version. So now when I've got a problem, I would say you roll forward, but you roll forward to the known good version. The key thing, uh, in, and it's a term we use regularly in the Chef community, of idempotence, which means that you get the same outcome every time. You may need to think about writing that explicitly into your cookbooks. So to give you an example, we had a user as part of your rollout but you find that user is, a, is a, an error, item potence means you'd have to write a cookbook that rolled that user out and ultimately remove their directory the, and so on. But yeah, 
So you've got the ability now to store all of the versions, and absolutely you can roll forward to a known point in time really effectively. Snapshotting, no. No. So um, if I have, for example, subversion as my um, versioning system, and um, I have um, yeah, made, made a release, mm -hmm. um, does Chef keep track about this? So and, and can I say, uh, go to version, uh, for example, I have five different versions installed. Yep. Can I say, remember that? and make that some kind of checkpoint which I can deploy to other machines yeah. and roll back so you to can that? Do it. Yes, you can, in two ways. You can do it manually, where you keep your version within subversion, and then you upload a cookbook and you give it a version within Chef. So nice cookbook upload of that version. You've actually got a, an absolute record there. We're finding that people are using some of the hooks that come in at other tools, like GitHub and, and SVN, in order that they can actually start to force change as well, so that once they've done the check-in, they can automatically upload. But it's a choice for you, which do you want to do, but yeah? Okay, and um, you talked about hosts having roles. Yep. Can, um, can hosts have multiple roles? So um, an example I asked in the uh, other uh, track about Ansible, um, suppose I have five data centers and two types of hosts mm -hmm. in each data center and I want to roll up a, out a configuration file only for hosts of type B in all data centers. Okay, so roles can be hierarchical, so you can have multiple roles. Okay. Versioning of roles is not yet in the product, but it's coming, but I don't think that would answer your question. But if you use some form of search linked to the naming standard you've got, then you've got the ability to deploy differently to each of those data centers. So very, very flexible. Okay. Shall we take a, somebody out? And there were about half a dozen hands up. So <laughs> <laughs> great questions there. I'm sorry. I'd I, I think uh, you can also discuss uh, that uh, after the yes. speech. Any, any, any other questions? Any short questions, if possible, because <laughs> we're going to run out of time. Yep. Thanks. Uh, how does Chef support me uh, to do little tasks like rebooting um, a group of role A? Okay. So there is the ability to do ad hoc tasks that yes. will support exactly what you yes. want. So that's one option. But of course, sometimes you actually want to install a patch, for example, and reboot. So within some of the handlers, there's the ability to specify reboots as well. Yes, but if I have to reboot um, systems for a customer uh, because yep. he just wanted. Yep. So you can do ad hoc, has, uh, ad, hoc had, ad hoc tasks, if I can say it, within Chef as well. So come talk to me after and we'll show okay. you. Thanks. Okay. One more or am I out of time? <laughs> it's, the, it's the left hand side of the room only, I'm afraid. <laughs> so I come from Puppet, I know Puppet. And so I am most interested in the differences and what's best or worse in Chef. And one thing I noticed was that uh, Chef is based on run lists, tasks, and there are also actions like action install. And in Puppet, this is defined as states of resources that is, is installed. And the, the run list or is um, defined by dependencies, mm -hmm. which makes sense. And Actions and def you define um, states by defining actions. This is quite uh, somehow um, contradictory to me. Okay. What do you say to that? <laughs> I'd say we've got two great tools out there that have got very different philosophies. Um, the, there are a number of differences in the implementation. The key difference I think you're relating to is that with Chef, we suggest that the user has a good idea of the order in which they want to conduct tasks. Whereas within Puppet, you're trying to do some determination of that. But happy to talk to you outside afterwards about that. I just think for the audience, there are some great tools out there at the moment. Thanks. The wording is pretty cool in Chef. The? The wording. So, use <laughs> knife. Yes. Hi. Uh, we already had this um, uh, issue on the MySQL um, um, speak before. Is there some option to have a rolling update, uh, like ask for a reboot, 
uh, reboot all database servers at the same time, I think is not a good um, idea. Mm -hmm. So is there some, um, um, some logic for some rolling update or something like this? So there is no built-in orchestration within Chef. You control it yourself. But I showed you the, the, the knife SSH a moment ago. So that would be one way that you could do this. But the, the procedure for doing it, or the order rather, is something that user, the user would determine. OK, thanks. OK. Thank you, folks. I think we're done, are we? I think so. Any other questions? I'm happy to talk afterwards. OK. OK. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.